I am absolutely terrible at Nuzlocke. I've never successfully completed a Nuzlocke of any Pokemon game, except for one Nuzlocke of Pokemon Gold version on the 3DS eShop. Other than this, my Nuzlocke history has been abysmal. So I decided to see what would happen if I did a Nuzlocke challenge of Pokemon Gold version using only Johto Pokemon, affectionately referred to as a Johto Lock. The rules of the Johto Lock are pretty simple. For starters, I decided to follow hardcore Nuzlocke rules. I can only catch the first Pokemon I encounter on a route, although I can reset the encounter if it's a Pokemon in an evolution line I already own. If a Pokemon faints, it's considered dead and unusable for the rest of the run. I can't use any items in battle. My Pokemon can't exceed the level of the next gym leader's ace Pokemon. And lastly, I can only use Pokemon that were introduced in Gold and Silver. In addition to all these rules, I also decided to include point redemption rewards on my Twitch channel to allow viewers to either sacrifice or revive Pokemon in the run. I'm sure that won't cause me any issues down the line whatsoever. So let's find out if I have what it takes to actually defeat a Pokemon Gold Johto Lock. My journey begins with me selecting my starter Pokemon, a Totodile I've decided to name Tudoodaloo. Tudoodaloo is going to be a very important Pokemon for the majority of the run, so it's crucial that I keep him alive. Hopefully, nothing bad happens to my adorable little croc guy. After being given an errand by Professor Elm, I work my way to Cherry Grove City. Since I don't have any Pokeballs yet, the Nuzlocke hasn't officially started, so I'll still have access to these routes for encounters later on. For now, I make my way to Mr. Pokemon, where I have a brief chat with Professor Oak and receive an egg. Walking back to Elm's lab after a frantic phone call, I bump into a red-haired trainer who insists on battling me with his Chikorita. Since Tadoodaloo gained a few levels, I'm able to win the fight pretty easily, although I did waste a berry in the process. Turns out, the red-haired trainer just stole that Chikorita from Professor Elm, but I ain't no snitch, so I tell the police that the trainer's name is Silver, which is obviously not a real name, and then I give the egg I just got to Professor Elm. With all this out of the way, I finally have access to Pokeballs and put them to good use on Route 29, catching a Hoot Hoot named Fred, which immediately gets sacrificed by one of my viewers. Rest in peace, Fred. On Route 30, I find a female spinner rack named Peter, for Tom Holland reasons, which I immediately risk losing to catch a Zubat in the Dark Cave. It wouldn't have been a bad trade, except that I was on my last Pokeball, so failing to catch Zubat would have cost me both Peter and the Bat. Fortunately, I managed to catch the Zubat, adding Bart to the team. Unfortunately, I can't use Bart in battle until he evolves into a Crobat, which requires Bart to have a high happiness stat, and to be a Golbat, which it won't evolve into until level 22. So, Bart stays in the party to gain happiness as I walk around, and we move on to the next area. Our last encounter before I take on the first gym is an unknown in the ruins of Elf, but that encounter doesn't exactly go as planned. After catching all my Pokemon, I'm ready to take on the Violet City Gym. But before facing the gym leader, I need to take on Bird Keeper Abe and his Spearow. His Pokemon is at level 9, which is the level cap for this section of the game. I need to make sure my level isn't too high, otherwise I'll over level before making it to Faulkner. Fortunately, none of this matters because his Spearow murders both Peter and Tudoodaloo in cold blood, ending my run before it really even began. I guess this just goes to show how terrible I am at Nuzlocke's. But I didn't really waste too much time on the run, so it's time to reset for attempt number two. After a quick reset, I basically do everything all over again. I once again pick Tadoodaloo as my starter, catch a Hoot Hoot named, oh, I forgot to nickname it. Oh well, her name is still Fred in spirit. I also catch another Spinarak named Peter again, a Zubat now named Zoom, and an unknown that I didn't give a nickname as I won't really use it anyways. Just kidding, it's because I forgot to nickname it. That's gonna happen a lot in this run. The rematch against Bird Keeper Abe goes much better, as I decide to make Tutudaloo use Rage instead of Scratch this time. Abe's Spiro does manage to get a crit on Tutudaloo, but a held berry helps Tutudaloo stay alive and get revenge against Abe. After beating the next gym trainer and leveling Fred up a bit in the Sprout Tower, it's finally time to take on the first gym leader, Faulkner. This gym is one of the first reasons I picked Tutudaloo for this run. I start the battle with Tadoodaloo and start spamming Rage against Faulkner's lead Pidgey. Fortunately, Pidgey uses Tackle instead of Mud Slap, so my accuracy is untouched as Tadoodaloo's Rage continues to build. After taking down Pidgey, Tadoodaloo levels up to 10, which is fine as the level cap only applies to the start of the gym battle. With some Rage built up, Tadoodaloo easily takes down Faulkner's Ace Pidgeotto with two more Rages, 
ending the first gym battle in my favor. After winning my Zephyr badge, I get a call from Elm asking me to take the egg away from his aide at the Violet City Pokemon Center, which I immediately hatch into a Togepi named Egg. Super creative name on this one. I also decide to brute force my way up Sprout Tower with Fred, giving me access to the HM for Flash. My next stop is Route 32, where I can encounter either Mareep or Wooper. My future plans for Whitney require me to have access to Mareep, and since this is the only route where I can find one before fighting Whitney, the next encounter is crucial. I step into the grass and... I manage to find myself a Mareep. This was a bit nerve wracking as I only had a 10% chance of finding a Mareep compared to a 35% chance of finding a Wooper since I was playing at nighttime. This is a huge weight off my shoulders. I name my new sheepy friend Beep Beep the Mareep and happily walk to the Union Cave. Here, I end up finding a wild onyx, which is perfect since I'll be able to evolve that into a steelix once I get a metal coat. I manage to catch the onyx and name it Rocky, in honor of the onyx you can trade for in Violet City. Now, around this time, I decided to incorporate the debts and sacrifices made during the run on the screen. This little section of the screen is honestly kind of useless since I forget to update it at times, but I suppose I should explain why I have negative 1 sacrifices for some reason. Due to the channel point redemptions allowing my viewers to sacrifice or kill a Pokemon, some of my viewers got into a war over whether or not Tudutalu should be allowed to live. Eventually, the winning side redeemed points to revive my still alive croc, so I just decided to bank up that revival for when I inevitably lose another Pokemon in another ridiculously stupid way. More on that later. After making my way through Union Cave, I finally make it to Azalea Town, where I notice a suspicious looking guy blocking off the Slowpoke well. Given the fact that I want to catch a Slowpoke since it does have a Gen 2 evolution, I decided to bust into the well with Kurt the Pokeball Crafter, brutalizing all the grunts I find in there with Tadoodaloo and my now evolved Beep Beep. After Kurt thanks me with a Lure Ball, I go back into the well and catch a Slowpoke, which I once again forget to nickname. Fortunately, I can't use the Slowpoke until I get a King's Rock anyways, and I don't plan on getting one of those anytime soon. With the Rocky Grunts gone from town, I can finally enter the gym and let Not Yet Fred eat every single bug in our path until we reach Bugsy. Fortunately, Fred and Spirit will be a useful ally against Bugsy, even if its attack stat isn't the highest. Unfortunately, I accidentally leveled Beep Beep past the level cap, so I can't use him in this gym battle, though I doubt I'll need him. Bugsy starts off the battle by sending out a Metapod. Kind of annoys me how half the gym leaders in Johto have no Johto Pokemon on their teams at all. There were so many interesting bug types to choose from, like Spinarak and Ariados, or Pineco and Fortress that Bugsy could have had on his team. But nope, Metapod is the Pokemon of choice. After taking him down with a few pecks, Bugsy sends out his Ace Scyther. Not yet Fred manages to put it to sleep with Hypnosis, which fortunately prevents Scyther from ramping up its Fury Cutter damage. Scyther stays asleep as eventually Fred takes it down with a few pecks. Last up is Kakuna and... Seriously, even Ledian would have been a more interesting choice of Pokemon. Anyways, soon to be Fred obviously takes care of Kakuna with no issues, giving me access to the Hive Badge. After the Azalea Gym, we get a chance to stomp our rival Silver into dust before making our way into the Ilex Forest. Here, we get access to the Headbutt TM, one of my favorite Gen 2 mechanics. I'm honestly kind of sad that the ability to headbutt trees for encounters doesn't happen in any other Pokemon games other than GSC and their remakes. It was such an interesting concept, but Game Freak has a tendency to add interesting things to Pokemon games that they remove immediately after that generation ends. Now, oh well. With headbutt, I could now go back to Route 33 for a new encounter, Heracross. Although I won't have any stab options for a while, Heracross is still a powerful Pokemon and a great addition to the team. So, we add Bobby the female Heracross to the team. Alright, we also did catch an Oddish named Flower, <laughs> get it? Which we will quite literally never use. It would require a Sunstone in order to evolve into a Belossum, and honestly, it's not really worth the effort, but theoretically we can use it in the future, so in the box it goes for now. And forever. Sorry Flower. In Goldenrod City, I go to the Name Raider, and Hoot Hoot the Not Fred officially becomes Fred. Slowpoke is also given the nickname School Wi-Fi because I can't think of anything slower. 
But Goldenrod isn't just a city where I can fix my Pokemon's names, it's also the location of the greatest challenge of the run, a match against Whitney. No beating around the bush here. After training up my Pokemon to the level cap, and making sure to trade a Drowsy for Muscle to Machop in the Goldenrod department store, we head straight into the Goldenrod gym and make our way to Whitney. You may be wondering why I traded for Muscle since I can't actually use a Machop or any of its evolutions in this run. Although that's true, I can use the Goldberry that Muscle is holding when it's traded to you to help heal one of my Pokemon during this gym battle. So here we go, the potential run ending battle. I lead off a Heracross against Whitney's Clefairy. Clefairy does no Metronome, which can be dangerous, but just goes for a double slap that of course hits 5 times and takes half its HP to a Horn Attack. I switch into Beep Beep, taking a 3 hit double slap and retaliate with a Thundershock, landing a crit for the KO. I have no idea if the crit mattered, but I'll take it. Next up is the Devil Incarnate Meltank. This thing terrifies me. I have a whole explanation of why Whitney's Miltank specifically is such a challenge, which I may or may not end up making into a video at some point in the future. Long story short, there aren't many good counters to it. Miltank starts off by using Stomp, naturally getting the flinch against Beep Beep. This is where the Goldberry comes in, healing Beep Beep back up to nearly full HP. On the next turn, Miltank goes for an Attract, but Beep Beep breaks through its infatuation and hits a Thunder Wave to paralyze Miltank. But, since I don't want the infatuation to become an issue, I take the opportunity to switch into Tadoodaloo just as Miltank is fully paralyzed for a turn. Tadoodaloo hits a Leer to lower Miltank's defense and is hit with Attract and Retaliation. This Miltank's move pool is seriously annoying. I go for the switch back into Bobby, tanking a stomp from Miltank that does about 20 damage. I risk a crit if I stay in, but Miltank is also paralyzed, so I take the chance and hit a Horn Attack for about 40% of Miltank's HP. A second stomp brings Bobby down to 10 HP. Time to switch back into Tadoodaloo, who tanks yet another stomp for 20 damage. Now, it's Tadoodaloo's time to shine. I go for a headbutt on Miltank, hoping to get either a flinch or paralysis, and... Tadoodaloo gets the flinch on headbutt! This means that a follow-up headbutt takes down the Demon Cow, winning me the plane badge without any deaths. This fight was really tough, but with some good luck and good positioning, I managed to get through without a scratch. All that's left to do now is to go to the National Park for the Bug Catching Contest, where I get myself a Scyther named Hash Slinging Slasher. I can't use her right now, but I will be able to once I get a Metal Coat later on in the game. That sounds a little familiar. Before continuing on to Ecritique City, Zoom to now Goldbat is finally happy enough to evolve into a Crobat, and Egg to Togepi evolves into a Togetic. Now the only thing blocking my way to Ecritique is the weird wiggling tree on Route 36, also known as the Pokemon Sudowoodo, also known as Bart after I capture it. Getting Bart out of the way lets me talk to an NPC in the area who gives me the TM for Rock Smash, which means that Bobby finally has a stab move. Once we finally make it to Ecritique, I decide to immediately leave Ecritique. At this point in the game, you can get to either Olivine City to the west or the Lake of Rage to the east, though you can't go any farther without access to Surf. This, however, means that I have a few more encounters available to me before fighting Morty. On Route 43, my encounter is Girafferig, which I managed to catch and give the nickname Spot. Spot is actually going to be one of the best Pokemon in this run, so I'm pretty excited to have captured it. I use Spot to help me fight against the Kimono Girls in Ecritique City, and absolutely nothing goes wrong. It did about 17, I think. It might be able to knock me out from here, so let's go Bobby. Oh! Oh, I'm an idiot! I'm an idiot! I'm an idiot! Oh, I forgot that pursuit would damage me if I if I tried to retreat. Okay, so I made a stupid mistake and something went horribly wrong. I kind of forgot what pursuit does and Spot paid the price for it. Rest in peace, my new friend. Bobby comes in to get revenge, but nothing can get rid of the pain of losing a loved one. But, but wait! Spot just pulled a Kingdom Hearts 2 Goofy, and is actually totally fine when he should be dead. Yeah, full disclosure, I used the Saved Up Revive a Pokemon Channel Point Redemption from earlier in the run to bring back Spot. Another event to take note of when it comes to these Point Redemptions. We'll get back to that again later, 
But for now, we have a new rule where a Pokemon can only be revived once per run, so Spot is actually in danger now if I pull another stupid stunt like that one. After beating the Kimono Girls and obtaining the HM for Surf, I return to Goldenrod City to speak to Bill, who gives me an Eevee I nicknamed Luna. I'm sure you'll never guess which evolution I'll be going for with a nickname like that one. Though an Umbreon would be great to use against Morty, I don't have the time to raise its happiness enough right now, but I have another plan to take on Morty, so it's back to the Ecritic Gym to take him on. The plan here is simple. Spot has a new lease on life, and he does not want it to go to waste. Morty sends out his Ghastly, and I take it out with a single confusion. I would have set up with agility, but I don't want to risk Ghastly using Curse against Spot. Next up is one of Morty's Haunters, which doesn't have Curse. This means I can safely set up an agility while Haunter goes for a spite. Now a speedy draft, Spot takes another 1 hit KO with confusion, which prompts Morty to send out his ace Gengar. Fortunately, Spot is immune to its Shadow Ball since he's a normal type Pokemon, meaning that Gengar can only use either Hypnosis or Mean Look. With the speed boost from agility, Spot outspeeds to do a good chunk of damage with confusion, and Morty seals his own fate by using Mean Look. What a complete moron! That huge misstep means I can take the KO with Confusion, and another 1 hit KO on Morty's last Haunter with a final Confusion wins me the Fog Badge. What a great sweep from Spot! It almost makes me feel guilty for bringing him back to life. Eh, but that's what happens when you have Channel Point Redemptions letting viewers play with the lives of your precious Pokemon, I guess. With access to Surf outside of battle thanks to the newly acquired Fog Badge, I now have a choice to go to either Olivine City or the Lake of Rage. It turns out that the TM for Thief is being kept in a Rocket HQ in Mahogany Town, and since I need that to get Metal Coats, I make the decision to go to the Lake of Rage. There I found a weird looking Gyarados, which I decide to take down with some Thundershocks from Beep Beep. After beating the Gyarados, I walk up to a suspicious guy named Lance, who tells me about Team Rocket making a weird radio signal that's forcing Magikarp and Lake to evolve prematurely. Seems kinda weird, but it also seems wrong to me, so I decide to work with Lance to stop Team Rocket's plan. It's time to storm Team Rocket's headquarters alongside this Lance dude and his dragon team, and he does absolutely nothing. Seriously, Lance lets me do all the work by myself. He even admits as much when we get to the end of our attack on the headquarters. Way to let a literal 10 year old child take on a criminal organization on their own, dumbass. Anyways, now I need to take down 3 electrodes that are powering up the device in the HQ that's causing the weird signal, so that means I'm risking my Pokemon to self-destruct. The last electrode does in fact use it, but fortunately, I had Fred use Reflect to minimize the damage, keeping all my Pokemon alive. Now that I have access to Thief, I teach it to Spot and head to Route 38 to try and steal some Metal Coats from some Wild Magnemite. Along the way, I end up catching a Mill Tank which I of course forget the nickname. Oops. Anyways, I end up getting two Metal Coats, allowing me to evolve Hash Slinging Slasher into a Scizor and Rocky the Onyx into a Steelix. Once I make it to Olivine City, I make sure to pick up the HM for Strength, which I'll be needing in the next gym, and make my way up to the Lighthouse to talk to the best gym leader ever, Jasmine. Jasmine is there to take care of a sick Ampharos named Amphi, who usually lights up the Lighthouse. She asks me to go all the way to Cienwood City to get some medicine for Amphi, and I feel obligated to accept her request. Helping a sick Pokemon in need is the right thing to do, as is helping a kind-hearted person like Jasmine. On my way to Cienwood City, I accidentally KO Mantine with a mistimed critical hit, though to be honest, I didn't really plan on using a Mantine in the run anyways, so... Uh, moving on. In Cienwood City, there's two things I can do. Firstly, I make sure to grab the secret potion from the pharmacy on the island, which I'll be giving to Amphi in a little while. I also make sure to take on the city's gym leader, Chuck. Chuck leads off with a Primeape, and I start with Zoom the Crobat. Zoom is the perfect Pokemon for this gym, since it has a 4 times resistance to fighting type moves and has access to stab wing attacks. Zoom's first wing attack gets a clean, one hit KO on Primeape. Beautiful. But now, Chuck sends out his ace, Polyrath, and this thing is way stronger than Primeape was. And Zoom gets a critical hit for the one shot, winning me the Storm Badge. Tough battle overall, could have spiraled out of control up any second. Got a little bit lucky on that one. With Chuck utterly decimated, we have access to the Fly HM for a quick trip back to Olivine City and give the secret potion to Jasmine. 
Normally, I'd take this opportunity to take on Jasmine in her gym, but level scaling in Johto is really weird. Jasmine's ace Pokemon is at level 35, but back in Mahogany Town, gym leader Price has an ace Pokemon with a level of just 31. This means I'm taking the trip to Mahogany Town first. With nothing else to do in Mahogany Town, I go directly to Price's gym for that matchup. Price leads with a seal, and I go with the now fully evolved Beep Beep. A critical hit on Dunder Punch takes Seal down off the bat, and Price sends out his ace Pillaswine. While I could stay in to hit Pillaswine with Fire Punch, I doubt it would get to KO, and I want to avoid any potential ground type moves, so I switch to Zoom on a useless Mist. I stay in with Zoom and use Confuse Ray, definitely not overcomplicating things here, and take an Icy Wind for half of my HP. Wanting to keep Zoom alive, I finally switch into Hash Slinging Slasher, who would have easily tanked an Icy Wind if Pillowswine hadn't hit itself with Confusion instead. A Metal Claw brings Pillowswine to yellow HP, so Price uses a Hyper Potion on the next turn. Uh, but it turns out that Pillowswine doesn't actually have any ground type moves, so Slasher can tank any of its attacks, letting me stay in and pick up the KO with two more Metal Claws, even tanking a Blizzard along the way. Last up is Dugong, so I switch back into Beep Beep, who finishes off the battle with a couple of Thunder Punches, winning me the Glacier Badge. I kind of did overcomplicate things there, but at least it still worked out in the end. Now that I have the Glacier Badge, it's back to Olivine City for my battle with Jasmine. She leads off with a Magnemite, and I go with Beep Beep again, who naturally takes down Magnemite with a single Fire Punch. Jasmine sends out her second Magnemite, and we get a repeat of that first turn. Next comes her Ace Steelix, who apparently also doesn't have a ground type move. Move pools in this game were really questionable. Even though I don't need to, I decide to give my now fully evolved Doodaloo the spotlight. He comes in on a Screech, and retaliates with a single Surf to win me the Mineral Badge. Just one gym leader left to go. Before we can move on to the next gym however, we need to go handle that group of international criminals again. Team Rocket has taken over Goldenrod City's radio tower, and it's once again the responsibility of a literal 10 year old child to evict them. Fortunately, this section of the game is just a long filler episode, and absolutely nothing of importance happens here. This is the only one that might survive... yeah, barely. Oh, I don't like that smoke screen, that's annoying. Let's see if he has an item to steal. A few moments later... Bro, please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Okay, so I might have messed up. The Rocket Executive posing as the Radio Tower's director has a team of only coughing and wheezing. Naturally, I tried to sweep him with Spot, but this led to disaster. Spot barely fails to pick up the KO with confusion, letting wheezing go for a smoke screen. Unfortunately, this caused Spot's follow-up thief to miss, letting wheezing explode and take my poor Spot down with him. This is the second time Spot has died now, and I couldn't be any more disappointed in myself. I failed poor spot not once, but twice in this Nuzlocke. Trying to defend myself by saying that I'm just a bad at Nuzlocke's, it's just a bad excuse. I could have easily switched into Slasher to keep spot alive there, but I let my hubris get the best of me. I just hope that I've learned my lesson and won't be losing any more Pokemon in such a stupid manner. The rest of the Rocket Takeover is actually uneventful, so I make my way through the Ice Path to get to Blackthorn City, where I'll obtain my final Gym Badge. While in the ice path, I catch a swinum named Peppa. Once I make it to Blackthorn City, I decide to go south to Route 45, where I catch a Teddy Ursa named Barry. Now that I've finished with all my encounters for Johto, it's time to face Claire for my final badge. With my final gym badge on the line, Claire sends out a Dragonair, and I go with Tadoodaloo. Unfortunately, I haven't been very focused on EV training my Pokemon, and have mostly been using rare candies to level up, and this fight shows it. Tadoodaloo fails to pick up the KO on Dragonair with an Ice Punch, despite holding a Never Melt Ice that I found in the Ice Path. This lets Dragonair go for a Thunder Wave, paralyzing Tadoodaloo and immediately making the fight more difficult than it should be. After tanking a Dragon Breath, I go for a Headbutt, picking up my first KO. Dragonair number 2 is up next. This one of course has Thunderbolt, which doesn't do a lot of damage, but still threatens to KO with a crit next turn. I switch to Slasher here, who tanks the Thunderbolt pretty well. Two Metal Claws take Dragonair number 2 down, so now it's time for Dragonair number 3. 
This one also goes for a Thunder Wave on Slasher after she hits a Metal Claw. Fearing the possibility of Flamethrower, I switch into my now evolved Luna the Umbreon. Luna takes a Dragon Breath pretty effortlessly and goes for a Sand Attack as it gets hit by an Ice Beam. I try to lower Dragonair's accuracy with Sand Attack, then follow up with a couple of Faint Attacks to take out Dragonair number 3. The Luna got paralyzed and took damage from an Ice Beam along the way. Last up is Claire's Ace Kingdra. I keep Luna in to go for a Confuse Ray while Kingdra uses a Surf, bringing Luna low. Luna heals with the held Goldberry, but a critical Surf would have still knocked him out, so I switch into the unnamed Milt Tank, who does not take Surf very well at all. Another switch into Beep Beep lets me tank Surf a little bit better, and paralyze Kingdra with a Thunder Wave. On the next turn, I go for a Thunder Punch that does just under half of Kingdra's HP, and Kingdra breaks out of confusion to go for a Hyper Beam. Fortunately, it missed, otherwise I may have lost my Electric Sheep there. Now, I'm getting worried about whether or not I'll make it through this fight without any losses, but seeing no other options, I stay in for another Thunder Punch, and Kingdra gets fully paralyzed! Now that Kingdra is in the red, Claire has to heal it with a Hyper Potion, so I use that as a chance to switch into Zoom to try some Parafusion tactics. The rest of this battle is a masterclass in using RNG to your advantage. With Kingdra both confused and paralyzed, I decided to start using Bite. This will throw possible flinches into the mix, and after one turn of paralysis, one Bite flinch, two Bite flinches in a row, Kingdra has done absolutely nothing to Zoom for the past 3 turns, and Zoom finishes the battle off with a wing attack, winning me my last badge. Is what I would say, except that Claire is a bigger sore loser than Whitney. She refuses to give me the badge until I go to the Dragon's Den to find a Dragon Fang, but given that this isn't really a challenge, I basically get my gym badge after wasting another couple of minutes. All that's left now is to take on the Elite Four. Before making my way to Kanto, I catch my actual last Johto encounter, a Chinchou named Zap, by fishing in New Bark Town. I actually needed this encounter so that I'd have a Pokemon to teach Waterfall to. Now, here's where things get really stupid. Remember those Channel Point Redemptions that haven't really impacted me much other than letting me revive Spot that one time? Well, unfortunately, these Point Redemptions are back and end up being how to do loop bites the dust. Honestly, I'm starting to question whether I should even have these point redemptions in the first place. But even without to do loop getting to the Pokemon League is pretty easy. Even my last fight with my rival Silver isn't difficult at all due to the weak Pokemon on his team, like Sneasel. Imagine having a Sneasel on your team. What a useless Pokemon it was in Gen 2. Anyways, now that we've made it to the Indigo Plateau, it's time to put together a team of my 6th best Pokemon. We have Beep Beep the Ampharos, Luna the Umbreon, Hash Slinging Slasher the Scizor, Zoom the Crobat, Peppa the Piliswine, and Miltank. Yeah, I don't know why I brought this one either, but it's fine. I'm sure Miltank will be helpful somehow, right? With the team ready to go, our final challenge begins. First up is Will, the Psychic Type Expert. He leads with a Zatu, and I of course go for Beep Beep. Zatu gets the Confuse Ray off, but Beep Beep attacks through the confusion and retaliates with a Thunder Punch to one-shot the Zatu. A great start. Next up is Jink, which outspeeds and puts me to sleep with a lovely kiss. How fun. The follow-up Psychic does more than half of Beep Beep's HP due to a crit, so I switch Luna to keep Beep Beep alive. Luna gets put to sleep as well, obviously. This Jinx is really starting to get on my nerves. Fortunately, it just goes for a few double slaps which don't do much damage, and then an Ice Punch that's still pretty weak. Another double slap, and then Luna finally wakes up and deals some damage with Feint Attack. After Confuse Ray, I bring Jinx super low with a Feint Attack, and then Jinx knocks itself out in Confusion! That nightmare is finally over, and I really appreciate the karma Jinx got there. Next up is Executor, who goes for a useless Reflect, while I, being a Master Strategist, go for Confuse Ray. Executor hits itself on the next turn, and so two Fan Attacks take down the Coconut Tree. Now come Will's second Zatu. A lot of duplicate Pokemon on teams in this game, huh? Anyways, he plays an Una Reverse card on me, 
and uses Confuse Ray on Luna, who of course hits himself. I don't like the Confuse Ray game anymore. Fortunately, Lozato's only other move that'll work is a laughably weak Quick Attack, so after another two Feint Attacks for another KO, we're on to the last Pokemon, Slowbro. Since Luna is low at this point, I switch into Miltank as Slowbro uses Amnesia. Slowbro does do good damage with Psychic as I go for Body Slam, but I decide to stay in, risking the crit to get off another Body Slam. And Slowbro goes for Curse. Great decision making there, Will. One final Body Slam wins me the battle, and lets me move on to Koga. Buckle up, because this one's gonna be fast. Koga starts off the battle with his Ariados, an interesting choice for an Elite Four member. I start off with Beep Beep again, and go for Fire Punch to pick up the immediate KO. Next up is Fortress, who is four times weak to fire, and therefore meets the same obvious fate. After that is Venomoth, who hits a Psychic, but goes down to a single Fire Punch. Beep Beep is on fire, literally. After stating that the only Pokemon on his team that I fear is Muk, Koga decides that's who he wants to send out next. I get up a Thunder Wave to paralyze it, and switch into Hash Slinging Slasher. I start setting up Sword Stance, and Muk shows off its annoying Acid Armor and Minimize moves. Fortunately, after two Sword Stances, I'm able to get the KO with a single Metal Claw and a Strength despite the Minimizes. Next up is Crobat, the last Pokemon, who sets up a useless double team and goes down to a single Metal Claw. Yeah, this fight was pretty easy overall. The next Elite Four member is Bruno. Fortunately, fighting types kinda suck in this game, so I don't have anything to worry about. Bruno's first Pokemon is Hitmontop, and my lead is Hash Slinging Slasher. I set up a Sword Stance on turn 1, and Hitmontop digs a hole. Since I can't hit him anyways, I take this as an opportunity to set up a second Sword Stance. I then proceed to sweep the rest of Bruno's team. Is what I would have said, except Slasher misses a Metal Claw against Machamp, who does pretty good damage with a non-critical cross chop. Eh, time to switch into Zoom. I'm scared of Machamp's Rock Slide, but I go for the Confuse Ray and am immediately rewarded for it. A Wing Attack fails to pick up the KO, and Machamp breaks through its confusion to hit with Rock Slide, which Zoom lives with 69 HP left. On the next turn, Bruno uses a Max Potion to heal Machamp to full, but apparently, Zoom was disappointed in himself after failing to KO Machamp on the previous turn, so this time around, he lands a critical hit for a clean one-shot. Last up is Onix, truly the fighting type Pokemon of all time. Since Zoom can't do much here, I decide to switch into Peppa, who proceeds to freeze Onyx to death with a single Icy Wind. Gonna be honest, I actually expected Onyx to survive that one, Bill's Wind's special attack is atrocious. But with that, three of the Elite Four members are down, one left to go. The last Elite Four member is the only decent Karen that ever lived. She may not yell for a manager after every slight inconvenience in life, but she sure as heck doesn't let trainers walk all over her either. I know this battle is going to be tough before it begins, especially with the Doodaloo out of action. Karen leads with Umbreon, and I start with Beep Beep to hit it with a Thunder Wave, getting an immediate full paralysis on turn 1. A Thunder Punch does a little bit of damage, and Umbreon lands a Confuse Ray. This move is the MVP for this run, I guess. I switch into the Bug with no Bug type moves, and set up a Swords Dance. Umbreon of course goes for a Sand Attack, because why wouldn't it? Fortunately, Metal Claw hits anyways and gets the KO on Umbreon. And suddenly, this battle goes from 0 to 100, as Karen sends out Houndoom. I'm kind of regretting sending out a Bug and Steel type Pokemon now. Slasher's only possible option here is Death by Literal Hellfire, so I go into Beep Beep, who takes a bit over a third of its HP to a Flamethrower. I risk the crit and go with the Light Screen option, but the preceding flamethrower brings Beep Beep way too low for it to continue in this battle. I have to switch it to Luna here, who fortunately tanks flamethrower pretty well with light screen up. Since I'm taking so little damage, I decide to go for a Confuse Ray, which pays off right away. Unfortunately, Luna can't do a lot of damage here, so I start using Sand Attack. I don't feel good about it, but I feel like it's my only option at this point. After 3 Sand Attacks, Luna is brought too low and needs to switch out. I go with Miltank, who takes a flamethrower poorly. 
but with a few other options, I decided to go for a body slam for a KO. And Houndoom lives, but there's still hope in the form of three sand attacks. Okay, so I relied on RNG, and the RNG decided not to cooperate. Fair enough, honestly. But, Miltank did enough damage to let Zoom come in for the revenge kill with wing attack. Just kidding. Karen heals with a max potion, and wing attack does less than half of Houndoom's HP. I need to go for fly to get the KO here, but of course it misses, as does Houndoom's flamethrower. The RNG is switching sides faster than you can say Joey Wheeler. My next fly connects and finally takes the KO on Houndoom. That nightmare is finally over, but there's still three Pokemon to go. Next up is Gengar, who I decide to hit with Zoom's Bite. Unfortunately, Gengar takes less than half its health and damage, so it doesn't even knock itself out with a curse. I decide to stay in and just take out Gengar here rather than switching to avoid curse damage, but apparently the KO makes it so I don't take the curse damage. Awesome! I'm pretty sure that was a Gen 1 mechanic, right? Murkrow is 4th, and this time I know I'll take curse damage, so I switch to Peppa. Two faint attacks do decent damage to me, but I manage to just barely not pick up a KO with Icy Wind in return. There's that terrible special attack stat I was talking about. I need to switch here to avoid a crit, so I go into Slasher to clean up this mess of a battle. Strength finishes off Murkrow, leaving Vileplume, the best Dark type ever, as the last Pokemon. Metal Claw misses, of course, letting Vileplume paralyze me with Stun Spore. Fortunately, Vileplume goes for Petal Dance, which does literally nothing. So Slasher is able to pick up the win after a few more turns. With that win over Karen, we're finally up to the champion battle against Lance. He's strong, and my only real answer to his Dragonites is Peppa with his terrible Ice type moves. This one is going to be tough. Lance's first Pokemon is Gyarados, so Beep Beep is the obvious lead. I outspeed and get the KO with a single critical Thunder Punch. We're off to a good start. Next up is one of Lance's Dragonites. It's level 47, but he has two Dragonites at this level, so I don't have a way of knowing which one I'm facing. But I do know that it won't have a Fire type move, so I switch into Slasher and tank a Hyper Beam pretty well. I get a free turn to set up Sword Stance. And on the next turn, I find out that this is the Dunder Dragonite. Sadly, this means I have to switch out Slasher or risk losing her to another Dunder. So I switch to Beep Beep, who dodges the Dunder. I then switch back to Slasher on the Hyper Beam, letting Slasher take the KO with a Strength while Dragonite recharges. Charizard comes out next to murder my bug, but unfortunately, I see no other options here. I don't want Beep Beep to take too much damage switching in. So it's sadly time to let Slasher go down. On the free switch, Beep Beep does tank a flamethrower, but picks up the KO with the one Dunder Punch. We're halfway there now. Blizzard Dragonite is the next one sent out, and I switch into Luna. But naturally, Dragonite used the Hyper Beam instead. Time for the patented Confuse Ray strategies. Sadly, RNG Jesus frowns upon me for doing so in the champion fight causing three completely wasted turns for Luna, who misses with a Screech, then gets fully paralyzed, and then gets paralyzed for a second turn in a row. This is going downhill fast. Sadly, I once again don't see many options other than letting Luna go down to a Hyper Beam. On the recharge turn, I finally decide it's time to send out Peppa. An Icy Wind does manage to pick up the KO, but I did get a critical hit, so that may have been why. Finally, the level 50 Dragonite comes out. This one packs Fire Blast, so I'm terrified of it. But right now, my only option is to hope Fire Blast misses. I select Icy Wind as my move, and... The Fire Blast connects for a clean one-shot on Peppa. This just went from bad to worse in an instant. I go with Beep Beep, planning to use Thunder Wave, but of course, Lance has Safeguard on his Dragonite. I don't think I've ever even seen that move be useful before now. All I can do now is go for Dunder Punch, but it doesn't do much. Beep Beep goes down to Outrage, leaving me with just Zoom. It's him against the world now. I have Zoom go for Fly first. It does decent damage, 
but so does Dragonite's Outrage. On the next turn, I go for a Wing Attack, hoping it'll do enough to get the KO. But sadly, it doesn't. And Zoom goes down to... Zoom actually lives with 1 HP. This fight may be bleak at this point, but I have to admit, I am so proud of Zoom for keeping the dream alive here, if only for a few seconds. Lance ends up healing with a full restore, and I have to admit defeat here. While I can try to spam Bite for flinches, there's no guarantee that, that would work, and it would do so little damage that I need to get tons of flinches. Sadly, this means that my run comes to an end. Honestly, this one really stung. I can only use my lack of skill in Nuzlocke as an excuse for so long. I definitely made some mistakes in that last fight, and I genuinely think that it would have been possible to win if things had gone just a little differently, or if I had made slightly better choices. With the run dead, I decided to end my stream there for the night, and return the next day after spending some time thinking about how this run went. Now, under normal circumstances, this is where I would talk about attempt number 3 and how it differs from attempt number 2, talking about the new Pokemon I caught, who survives longer or dies earlier in the run, how different some of the major fights end up being. But after stepping away from my stream that night, I only had one thought running through my mind. That champion fight is a guaranteed win if only I still had to doodle -oo. So I made a decision. I know it won't be a popular decision, and I know it's technically against Nuzlocke rules, but I just can't stand the idea of losing a Nuzlocke just because a Pokemon was lost without me actually losing it in a battle. So I decide to make a compromise. Thinking about it, I came to the realization that there really isn't any good reason to have channel point redemptions to allow my viewers to sacrifice Pokemon. Why would I even subject myself to the torture of relying on certain Pokemon in key parts of the game, only to have viewers decide to redeem a few points and take that option away from me, effectively killing the run without me even making a misplay? I also think about how easy that Morty fight was with Spot, who only lived to see that fight because of a channel point redemption to revive a Pokemon. So here's my compromise. I'm not going to reset this entire run. Instead, I reset the game to right before I challenged the Elite Four. Every Pokemon that fell to that champion battle, which was supposed to go differently with Tadoodaloo, is brought back to try again. In exchange, Miltank will remain in the death box since she was lost to Karen instead of to Lance. I think that's a legitimate death. I know it goes against Nuzlocke rules, but in the end, I honestly felt that the biggest reason I lost to Lance was because I lost Tadoodaloo forcing me to rely on Peppa, who couldn't stand against that level 50 Dragonite since it has Fire Blast. I also decided to remove those channel point redemption options from my stream, so that scenarios like this won't ever happen again. It's just good old fashioned nuzlocking for me from now on, no viewers sniping or reviving my Pokemon. With that being said, the next evening, it's time to rematch the Elite Four. Will people make trash talk about me and say it's a skill issue on YouTube whenever I post this video? Absolutely. Do I care? No, I'm doing this for fun. I'm, I, I, I acknowledge I'm a bad Nuzlocker, but that's okay. Now, since I'm technically breaking Nuzlocke rules here, I decide to make it a bit harder for myself and bring only 5 Pokemon, leaving Peppa at home this time. My 5 choices are Luna, Beep Beep, Slasher, Zoom, and of course, Tadoodaloo. The Elite Four goes about the same this time around, with one major exception. Oh, I didn't heal Earthquake PP. That's okay. No nightmare battle against Karen this time! Honestly, this was so much easier with Tadoodaloo on the team, but we still got that rematch with Lance, and it'll still be tough despite having Tadoodaloo on the team. I know I said it's gonna be a guaranteed win, but things can always go wrong, so let's get into it. Once again, Lance leads off with his pathetic Gyarados, and I of course send out Beep Beep. Thunder Punch gets the clean KO again, no crit involved this time. The first Dragonite comes out. I know they all have annoying special moves, so I decide to go for Light Screen here and end up dodging a Thunder Wave. That turn went perfectly. I stay in to test out Thunder Punch damage, but sadly a second Thunder Wave paralyzes me first, and stops Beep Beep from attacking. On the next turn, Dragonite misses a Hyper Beam, 
and Thunder Punch lands for a decent chunk of damage, though it's not threatening a KO next turn without a crit. Still, I stay in and get yet another Thunder Punch off and shrug off a Thunder in the process. Great move from Lance. Now, I expect Lance to heal, but he goes for Hyper Beam instead. It does a lot of damage, and Beep Beep gets paralyzed, so I decide to switch. In hindsight, trying to get a Thunder Punch instead would have been a much better decision, but I'll have to live with that error. I know Zoom will outspeed, and Lance clearly doesn't love this Dragonite enough to heal it, so I send him out to get the KO with the Wing Attack. Next up is Blizzard Knight. This is where I realized Tudududu would have been a better switch, but I stick with Zoom for now. I have Zoom go for the signature Confuse Ray, letting Dragonite hit Zoom with Thunder Wave, although the Paralysis is immediately healed by a Berry. Now it's time to switch into Tudududu, and this is where Disaster strikes. On the switch, Tudududu gets hit with Thunder Wave and is paralyzed now. Luckily, Lance wastes the next turn going for a Blizzard, and I manage to get the KO with the Nice Punch. Okay, that's starting to get annoying. This Nuzlocke is turning into a masterclass on the importance of EV training. For reference, Tudududu is holding Never Melt Ice here, so that Ice Punch was actually getting boosted, just like it was against Claire. On the next turn, Dragonite goes for a Hyper Beam, but misses it, and Tudududu gets fully paralyzed. Expecting another Hyper Beam, I switch into Slasher to tank it, which she does perfectly. Slasher takes the KO, prompting Charizard to come out for the National Park's Bug Frying Contest. Tudududu tanks Flamethrower well on the Switch, but the follow-up Hyper Beam does a good chunk, and Surf barely misses out on the KO. Seriously, make sure to do at least some EV training when you play Pokemon games. Rare candies are considered to be bad for a reason. Zoom comes in during Charizard's recharge turn and picks up the KO with the Wing Attack. Two more Pokemon to go. Somehow, the next Pokemon out is actually Aerodactyl. It's a threat to Zoom, but the signature Confuse Ray works out well for the first turn. I decided to try going for Bite Flinches this time around, but unfortunately it doesn't work, and Zoom takes a Rock Slide for his efforts. I switch into Slasher, who takes two Rock Slides, but fortunately doesn't flinch, and takes out Aerodactyl with a Metal Claw. Fire Blast Knight is the last hurdle. I have all five of my Pokemon available this time, but they're getting low on HP, so this one's a nail biter. As much as I hate to do it, I decide that the best course of action here is to let Slasher go down to a Fire Blast. Rest in peace, buddy. You've done an amazing job. At this point, I realize that I haven't sent Luna out yet, so his HP is at max. As much as I hate doing so, I decide to rely on RNGesus one last time and start going for Sand Attack. For future reference, I'll be banning all accuracy lowering or evasiveness increasing shenanigans in my Nuzlocke. But in this Nuzlocke, now this Nuzlocke allows all the shenanigans. I've already been through enough. I'm getting through this one way or another. After three sand attacks, I go for a stupid Confuse Ray into a safeguard. It was a stupid move, really stupid. And unfortunately, I decide that Luna needs to pay the price for my foolishness. After hitting a weak quick attack for trick damage, Luna goes down, giving me my free switch into Tudududu. This is still a risky play, as Tudududu's paralysis lets Dragonite go first. But Luna's sand attacks come in clutch, letting Tudududu dodge an outrage and hit an ice punch in retaliation. But he's not out yet, and on the next turn, a second outrage miss. With that miss, Tudududu is able to break through its paralysis and hit one last ice punch, winning me the champion battle and making me champion of the Johto region. That was a rough one. I still feel a little guilty about refighting the Elite Four with Tudududu on the team rather than resetting the run, but I think my victory in the second attempt really shows how important Tudududu was to my team, especially in beating Karen's Talendoom with one hit. Allowing my viewers to sacrifice Pokemon just made the challenge unnecessarily difficult for me, and there really was no reason to have that be an option in the first place. So, for future Nuzlocke, I won't have sacrifices or resurrections as an option, and it'll be just me, my Pokemon, and the random numbered degenerate that determine how my runs go. That being said, 
I'm glad I was able to clutch out that second attempt at Lance, and I'm even considering redoing this entire Nuzlocke again in the future, so I can say that I beat the challenge properly. But until then, I'll be doing some other Nuzlocke's over on my Twitch stream. My next one will be a Hoenn Lock using only Pokemon introduced in Generation 3, which I'm really looking forward to. I'll be starting that Nuzlocke after this video uploads, so make sure to check out my Twitch channel to see me play that Nuzlocke live. Wait! I almost forgot about Kanto. I won't be doing a Kanto Lock of any Pokemon games, since a Kanto Lock is basically just a vanilla Nuzlocke of the Kanto games, but I did go through Kanto and the Red Fight on this playthrough of Gold version after I defeated Lance. If you want me to make a video about my adventure through Kanto with some of the Pokemon that stayed in my boxes during this run, please give this video a like. If this video makes it to 500 likes, I'll make sure to make a video to let you all know whether or not I managed to get through Kanto and take down Red. I wish you all the best of luck in your future Nuzlocke endeavors, and as always, thanks for watching.